Today I'm going to be showing you guys a multiplayer guide for the Soviet Union in Hearts of Iron 4. Now, you might be wondering what is the difference between a Soviet guide for single player and a one for multiplayer. Pretty much regular normal guides are kind of in the sense that they're going to be used mostly against the AI so they're not as in depth and they're kind of a little bit on the easier side. But today I'm going to be showing you guys a multiplayer guide so if you guys do well in the multiplayer guide it's obvious that you can easily win in single player if it works for multiplayer. So pretty much this should be a guide to work for everybody, and I mean everyone. Now really quick here before I get any further into this tutorial, because I know a couple of people are going to say that what I'm about to say is inaccurate. This guide is going to be going over what's called a no air Russia gameplay, which is like a Russia with no air force and they just concentrate all on land warfare, which I'll show you how to get it to work. Now some people think that's a bad idea. Now personally, I myself believe if the Germany you're going to be going up against is a good player, you're going to want to do a no air Russia so you can have more industry and guns and stuff. Or if you're going up against a Germany and multiplayer who is horrible at the game and pretty much all his allies have no idea what they're doing to the point where Italy is asking Germany for help to conquer the Ethiopian civil war down here, or not a civil war, but you get the idea. That is probably the only, and I mean only time I would recommend doing an air Russia. So, like I said, we are expecting this to be used in multiplayer, so I am going to be going off a few very common rules in the multiplayer community. The rules I am showing you guys on screen are very, very common in just about every single Hearts of Iron 4 multiplayer server. These rules, I can guarantee you, if you're in your first multiplayer match or the 20th, even a brand new server that's hosting its first game, it is going to have the majority of these rules on there regardless. So that is what we're going to be basing this gameplay off of. Second off is the focus tree path, as you can see popping up on your screen now. Now, the great purge, you don't have to do it exactly in the focus tree path. As long as you have it done before, I would say, May to July, somewhere in that ballpark, probably June would be best. As long as you do the great purge before then, you really shouldn't have the civil war fire off. You should have no issues whatsoever. And the only time you should do it before then is if a rule requires you to do it early. Second off, if you are already mid-focus, say for example down here later on, I tell you to go down the anti-fascist diplomacy, that is 210 days. If you're halfway through it and then you go to war with Finland, then you need to do lessons of war, okay? I don't care what focus you're halfway done with or anything. If you've done the Great Purge and you can get lessons of war early on compared to having to wait until the actual war with Germany, it is going to be way better for you to just get lessons of war early on. So let's go ahead and talk about construction, which is one I'm sure everybody wants to know. So some people have different opinions on this. Me personally, I don't think it's really worth it just to build infrastructure from the start. I've seen it work out better, but I think just to make it easier on people, it's better just to build civs a little bit easier. And it's really not that too big of a difference. So pretty much you want to build everything east of the Stalin line river. Now the Stalin line river is this, it is starts up here in Latvia. It's this long river that stretches all the way down splits here. Go across Vitebisk, go to this river, and then it's everything east of this river. So pretty much you're going to want to build civilian factories here, 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 here. Pretty much as long as they're behind this river because this is where you're going to defensively hold later on against the Germans. Also, here's a little tip for you as well. Something that's going to really slow down the Germans. I don't know if this is going to be common very long for not being a rule because when i tell you guys this i know a lot of people are going to start doing this in multiplayer and it's really op um just delete civilian factories before the war actually starts west of the stalin line what ends up happening is because of the enemy is moving forward into your territory germany is advancing they're going to have partisans and because there's no factories there's only a few airfields the majority of the things that the partisans are going to be destroying is airfields because that's the only thing that the partisans can actually target. So your partisans, if you delete all the factories by clicking an area, clicking the little X in the bottom right, and then click OK, that is going to cause exclusively damage to infrastructure, which is if the German person player AI can't repair it, it is going to starve all their troops west of the Stalin line. You don't even have to do the decisions to destroy the infrastructure. That alone through partisans will completely and effectively cut off the German army and the access within probably three, six months of them moving forward. Next up, let's talk about your doctrine because that's probably going to be the number one thing. All right, so pretty much you want to go down mass assault. Most people disagree with that. They think superior firepower is better. Normally, I would agree with you. But because the Soviets are going to have so many troops on the field, you're going to want a doctrine which is going to give you a lot less supply issues, which is obviously 
the Mass Assault Doctrine. So if you go down here, they give bonuses for tanks, supply consumption, reduction penalties, and also I'm going to be covering templates in this video. And down here, which uh, is it this one? No. This one? No. It's one of the, there it is. Infantry combat width is actually lowered, so you'll be able to fit extra infantry divisions in. So I like this one more for the Soviet Union because they've already got so much manpower and they'll have more of a defensive uh, mindset and they'll also have this guy here which gives another 10% anyway now let's talk about research what you are seeing on your screen is correct you are going to get a light tank too which is this one right here right off the bat now you're probably wondering why would he do that well really quick all right you start off with a decent sized penalty already off the uh, bt7 right or not a penalty but it takes a while to get the idea behind this is if germany is a player and they're going to go down army innovations and in then treaty with USSR, you might be able to beat them in time. I mean, you really won't because the focus is 70 days. So this is like 20 days longer than required. But basically you could use your political power to get an armor tech guy first. That would knock off enough time for you to be able to get this very early on if you follow the focus tree path. So what you would end up doing is one of two things. Either A, instead of light tank two, you would research heavy tank one and then heavy tank two with the treaty. Um, the bonus you get from the treaty or option a which is what i or option b which is what i do most of the time because who doesn't love a t-34 and they're easier to produce and get way more of them out and be able to cover a large amount of the front line get the bt-7 then immediately as soon as germany starts doing treaty with ussr get the uh, t-32 here researching and then that way the bonus will be saved so you get a two year ahead of time penalty removal off the t-34 you could do the exact same thing for the kv-1 but remember KV ones are 21 or 27 production. This tank right here is only half, but so Union is not really rich in uh, tungsten, but they are rich in uh, chromium. So or correction, chromium. <laughs> I know that's not the right way to say it, but anyway. So that is going to be your research. Now let's talk about your political power. Yes. So pretty much you have about five to six years, at least five, but usually servers won't let you uh, wait over six if you're Germany to actually go to war with the USSR. So you have between five and six years before you have to start picking military advisors or the military staff down here for bonuses. Next, let's talk about the glorious Soviet Navy. So you're probably wondering, what is he going to do with the Navy? Oh, what's he doing? Oh, he's deleting the entire Soviet Navy lineup production. And most people are probably wondering, why would you do that? Well, let's be honest. You get six dockyards. Germany starts off with 11. They have more than doubled than you already. And the Soviets should never, ever, ever, ever have to worry about dockyards. So pretty much, it, and I mean worry as in you should never have to consider Navy production to be a priority for the Soviet Union. So just don't worry about it. Just totally drop that off your mind right now. You want to build only convoys because by the time World War II kicks off with all the bonus you're going to have, look at this, six dockyards, we're getting one new convoy around every week. Usually, since you start off with 38, or well, technically 50, and then you have trade and supply and everything, you're going to have probably at least close to, if not more than, a thousand convoys by the time the war starts off. Now, if the Allies are guarding the Atlantic, you're a multiplayer that is going to be enough convoys that the United States, if you really want to do planes, which I wouldn't even recommend because you have no doctrine, if they want to send you that, if they want to send you guns, if they want to send you trucks, if they want to send you tanks, whatever it is they want to send you, you have more than enough dockyards or uh, uh, naval convoys to be able to receive a huge, huge amount of weaponry. Next up, how would you deal with Spain and China? So, Basically, first off, with Spain, you're going to send as many weapons and as much equipment as humanly possible. Don't send any aircraft to them because then you're going to need to supply them with fuel. They don't really have that much fuel to begin with. As you can see, they have zero. So there's really not a reason to send the, you know, Spain any kind of planes whatsoever. Just send them guns, support equipment. That's it. And really, you shouldn't even send them support equipment. You should just send them guns. Then you want to send Mountaineer Infantry Divisions, which one way to do that, you shift, left click your entire army. Scroll down here really quick, find one or two Mountaineers, double click them, put them in a new army, boom, that's all your Mountaineers you're going to send to Civil Wars. So, just like that, you'll be able to send like five. So, now what we're going to do is we are going to follow my own guide, which I just showed you guys, and then once 1941 to 1942, whenever Germany actually finally declares war on us, is when I'm going to come back and show you where we are and then what to do to deal with the fascist pigs. So now the Marco Polo bridge incident has fired. Now, here's what I was talking about earlier. So we're going to go ahead and send guns here. We're going to send, now that I've actually got a surplus, 
we are going to send 17,000 guns to China with one sport equipment monthly. But, as for the volunteers, this is what I was trying to show you guys earlier. So we can send seven volunteers here. So we're going to go ahead and take these two guys, put them there with Zhukov. We're going to send those guys to China. I'm just showing you what I was talking about earlier. Once they've been accepted, now we can send volunteers to Communist China. We can send one. And basically, you would just keep doing this and assigning generals to different groups. I would say the smaller the better. By the way, I got Zhukov to a level 6 just in the Spanish Civil War. So that gives you an idea of how easy it is to actually still get XP. Then I would send a low-level general to him. Then wait for them to go so they're not in the uh, list of volunteers available. Then just keep doing that and you will have a ridiculous amount of volunteers. Already, We, be I believe we've got like 12 or something like that. I mean, we have a lot now, when you get the Molotov Ribbon Top Pack, you're going to sign the treaty. Now, probably if you have really good detection, uh, unlike me, made that mistake, and you're actually able to see when Germany's starting to do it or go down that path, make sure you save up a lot of political power. I just got lucky. Basically, what you're going to do is you are going to take claim state from multiple zones. It's going to cost a little bit of political power, but what's going to happen is these countries are going to give events. Sorry about that. Uh, you're going to get events from all these different countries about things like, oh, we demand zones, you need to give it to us, all this other kind of stuff. And basically what's going to end up happening is you're going to start getting all these different events. And if you have historical AI on, which I do, they will just like that one right there. Just like uh, Bessarabia, we demand it from Romania. We're going to demand that. And within a few days, we're going to get this area just like that. And the same thing's going to happen with all the other countries. So we're going to do Lithuania next. And then once you have all of these guys, or once we have the 12 political power, the final one you should probably do would be Finland. Because as soon as you do that, Finland's going to uh, say no. So because Finland says no to that, you're then going to be able to go to war with them. After you don't have a focus, like, well, actually, I don't have a focus right now. I'm going to go and send my army up there after I do this. And then we're going to be at war with a country. And then I can go ahead and remove the great purge penalties so now germany's getting ready to go to war with ussr also known as us i'm going to show you guys a few strategies and a few different ways to defend now the first option which i like to do sometimes in multiplayer i will get a ridiculous what? amount of pretty much just garrison divisions mixed with some actual main 40 width divisions or 39.2 uh, width whatever you want to call them uh basically what you do here is you put a bunch of divisions inside these territories and tell them to garrison everything now you're going to lose a ridiculous amount of divisions which is going to cause your losses to skyrocket but this is what you do and the reason behind it one day before the war you can actually delete as many factories as you want well actually if you're a multiplayer you want to do it a little bit earlier now what's going to happen is because you delete all the factories inside of i guess we'll call it no man's land What's going to end up happening is the partisans are going to begin sabotaging exclusively infrastructure. Now, because they're sabotaging the infrastructure, if Germany or the player Germany is not constantly keeping an eye on it, constantly repairing it, he's going to have seriously ridiculous levels of just he has to repair infrastructure or he's going to lose a ridiculous amount of tanks guns and probably the attrition is going to be so bad he might even lose men i mean it's going to absolutely just decimate his entire army if he does not keep maxing it out to the highest level yes you are losing a good amount of factories with this but if you're going to do the stall online strategy then well <laughs> there's really no reason just to give this stuff over to the germans so now everything has been deleted in here let me explain the idea behind all these guys now what's going to happen if you tell them to garrison everything like i have here you're going to have probably two to three guys on every airfield every city every fort every everything now basically because their army is going to begin moving up they're going to have to attack your infantry inside of these zones so when they attack your infantry they're on one hand damaging the infrastructure they're about to move into and they're also getting well fought they're losing equipment they're losing men and that's going to cause them to slow down so we are now officially at war with germany it happened about probably three or four months ago so basically let's go ahead and see what our stats are so if we follow my guide correctly by August 14th, 1941, we're sitting at 237 civilian factories, 130 mills, and almost 500 divisions. Now, for Germany, we have 
a good chunk more civilian factories than their max. Their max is, I mean, realistically, they're probably at 180. We just did a really bad decryption encryption area, but even their max amount with very low uh, decryption, we're still doing very well. So how well has this actually worked? So it works okay. Uh, we were actually repairing stuff here for a little while, but you can see it's damaged some of the infrastructure. So loss-wise, it hasn't been that great for us. We've lost, I think... Uh, yeah, to Germany, we've lost 125,000. Uh, Germany has lost uh, 51,000. So they're, they're taking about every two uh, of us out for every one they lose. Now, here is something else I want to go ahead and mention. So once they actually push up to the Stalin line, the only thing the Soviet Union can do is to pretty much wait them out and then go and push west. Now, the only reason I say that's the only thing you can do is because that's the only thing you can do. You have to wait for the Allies to actually do a D-Day. And until they do a D-Day, there's nothing that's going to stop the stalemate. Because as long as you have your tanks here in this area, like I said earlier, which... Why aren't the tanks moving? Right? Hold on, wait a minute. Oh, the fallback line must have got erased. Uh, anyway, so pretty much once they push up to the Stalin line, it's going to be a stalemate either way until the Allies can make a D-Day landing, forcing them to split their forces in half, and then you move west. So really that is pretty much the entire guide right there. I mean, dead serious. That is literally the entire guide. The rest of it is just wait on this line until the Allies either come and save you, or wait on this line until Germany gets so powerful they can push you, or you're so powerful you can just easily push them. More realistically, what's going to happen though is because you have such a large tank production and you have such advanced tanks compared to them and you're popping them out so quickly, more than likely, you would hopefully be able to get enough of them out to push through this little region here. And then once you have enough, start breaking through slowly and just repeatedly cause encirclements. So pretty much, guys, that is the entire guide for how to play the Soviet Union. Now, I know like some of my other guides, I'll actually go all the way and show you guys it's winning and everything. But I mean, really, there's no real reason to because we're stuck waiting for the Allies to do a D-Day and the AI sometimes won't. So again... Your best option is the Soviets if the Allies don't or won't do a D-Day or for some reason it's an AI and it can't. You're just going to have to push through this little spot here once the Germans push up to the Stalin line. And then after you've built up a large enough army to go on the offensive, you just start breaking through and causing encirclements. And eventually Germany runs out of manpower compared to the vast Soviets and then you crush the fascist dogs. So anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. I will see you guys next time. Stay awesome.